and we'll see how far we get today. Hopefully we can spin up some notebooks and start playing around today. All right, well, maybe we'll get started. Uh, so this is the second lecture of uh, our course has a very long name, Introduction to Machine Learning for Scientists. Uh, it's also co-listed Physics 494 and Physics 594. Um, but I'm, you know, people come from a variety of backgrounds. So again, if I say something or use terminology that, uh, that you're not familiar with, please stop me uh, and I will do my best to, to slow things down and, and make sure we're all on the same page because really my only expectations are some familiarity with multivariable calculus and uh, you know, linear algebra and some general ideas in physics and, and we'll get to more advanced things. So last time we really talked about uh, applications, a little bit of uh, you know the big picture applications, both in the the general non physics world and then at the end in the physics world, um, and you know other courses on machine learning uh, would tend to start you know after talking about the power of, of deep neural networks um, would go back and start from the beginning and talk about linear regression and logistic regression. Uh, my preference is to not do that so that we can actually get uh, quite, quite far and actually get to some applications. And I haven't done design the first assignment yet, but maybe in the first assignment, we'll revisit some of those uh, simple learning tasks, um, which you know can be recast as very simple types of, of, uh, of neural networks. Um, the other thing I'd like to uh, point out is uh, and give a shout out to is, uh, is uh, Jean-Van Ma is here today uh, from Isaac, the high performance uh, supercomputer cluster that we have here at UT that we're going to be utilizing for the class. And uh, he has worked tirelessly for us thus far um, to make sure everything goes smoothly. Uh, we definitely appreciate the, the effort that, uh, that he's put in to making sure that we'll have access not only to open on demand, but potentially even uh, access to some pretty nice GPUs when we start to train some more complicated networks. Um, so uh, thank you very much uh, for, for that, Jean Fun. And thanks for, thanks for coming today. Um, it's, it's definitely fun to, you know, this is a, this is a trial for courses here. Uh, this is going to be the first time that any class has used the cluster in real time through open on demand. Um, so there may be hiccups, uh, but there'll be hiccups on the way towards having access to serious computing power that we might not have with our laptops. Um, and as we kind of briefly talked about last week, you know, one of the, the real advances was really computing power. Um, that's why, you know, a combination of lots of data and then Moore's law that we have, you know, very, uh, very powerful computers and in particular GPUs uh, have gone a long way, you know, started out as, uh, as ways to render polygons in, uh, in video games, but now allow us to, you know, ultimately just turns out that the types of things that you need for video games, which is linear algebra uh, on, uh, you know, uh, small matrices um, really, really fast turns out to also be a good thing to train neural networks. And in fact, the new uh, the, the latest GPUs from you know, companies like NVIDIA and AMD and, and so on um, now have these uh, tensor cores is what they call them, at least the NVIDIA does. So they have very low level hardware that allows you to train neural networks faster. In some day, cases, much, much faster even than conventional, very powerful GPUs. And you know, an individual GPU um, like V100 a couple of years ago could cost as much as seven or $8,000. So there's a lot of compute packed into uh, those. Um, as some people might know if they bought one and have one uh, at home. Uh, so anyways, okay, so let's get started for today. So we're really gonna jump into things today. Um, so let me share my screen and, and basically what I, I tend to, as I said last time, I will just uh, kind of write on a, a virtual whiteboard in real time. And then after the lecture, I will make that available to everybody. Um, so please don't feel like you need uh, to take notes. Everything will be uh, will be there, but there'll be some kind of active stuff where you'll need to do some calculations potentially at some point. Um, but you can just kind of sit back and, and listen to the the derivation. Oh, there's a question. Um, all right, James is telling us about the uh, Radeon Instinct with tensor cores. Thank you. Um, yeah, and, and actually, one thing that's that uh, AMD. I mean, the the uh, the new architectures that they're pushing and this generic framework, which is called Rockham, um, that that AMD has, is is pretty pretty cool as a way to kind of pull together at the level of a uh, um, you know an, almost like an API. Uh, to be able to make it transparent to the user when you're using uh, different types of hardware. And I, my guess is that that type of thing will continue to happen. That as a programmer, you don't really want to know if you're targeting a GPU or not. You just want the thing to run as fast as possible on the hardware that you have access to. Right? You want to try to uh, make that, that piece transparent. Okay. 
So any questions about last time or anything? Oh, one thing I should mention. So the, uh, the Python code that I pasted into that LaTeX document got cut off by one line. So many people realized that uh, there was no uh, plt.legend and thus your legend would not show up. Uh, on mine, of course, it showed up because the line of code was there. Um, so uh, sorry if that caused uh, consternation. Uh, I'll be more careful last next time. It was, I think it was like right at the end of the page, it just got cut off. Um, but many people either uh, put a title on or did all kinds of stuff. So that's great. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. All right, so can everyone see these, this lecture? Blank screen, good. Yeah, I can see a blank screen. All right, perfect. And do people have a preference? I can either write in uh, portrait mode or in landscape mode. Does that, anyone have a pre preference? Well, as long as it's readable, I don't care. Yeah. If, you can, if you can't see it, let me know and I will. Uh, I can switch. All right, so let's get started. So as a, you know, last time we talked about modern applications, things that are happening right now. Um, and so I thought it might be fun uh, just to kind of recall the history, which is a pretty recent history, re basically. Um, so as a brief history, Neural networks. So let's make a little timeline here. All right, so basically what people say is like the modern birth of, uh, of AI is this famous workshop in 1956 at Dartmouth. People call it, not surprisingly, um, the Dartmouth workshop. And as kind of a, a funny side story is, you know, the, the terminology of artificial intelligence was kind of decided for at that workshop specifically to make sure that the, the field was kept separate from cybernetics, which was a, another kind of ongoing thing at the time. And there was, as is often the case, there was some um, bad feelings between certain scientists. And so they decided to distinguish themselves from the rather active cybernetics uh, community by, by coining this name AI. So this is really the, the birth of when people started thinking about things um, you know, along these lines and started writing, writing programs. And then the, the next big technological feat, and we'll talk about these today, although they're not really um, used in modern ne neural networks, was kind of the first accurate or the first model uh, of, uh, of a neuron that could be used in an artificial neural network, which is called a perceptron. That was like the 1950s uh, to 60s. And then there was kind of not really a, a huge amount of progress in there. Uh, there was lots of uh, people claiming very great things were going to happen that no one would have to work anymore because we, should, we could have intelligent machines that did all our work for us. Uh, and then uh, those promises didn't really come to light. And so in the 70s, this led to something that people called the AI winter, basically because all funding dried up, you know, there was like a huge influx of cash and then it all left. Um, and people are worried about that now actually in terms of quantum computing because of all the hype around quantum computing these days that, you know, at some point maybe the funding agencies will decide all the promises uh, are uh, haven't haven't come you know come to fruition on the the timescale of a few years. But you know, to be honest, the the researchers in the 1970s working on this weren't so far off. So maybe it wasn't 20 years. Um, but if they jumped ahead, you know, 40 more years until the hardware caught up, then certainly if people had seen AlexNet uh, or AlphaFold, you know, the funding agencies in the 1970s would have changed their tune, and there might not have been such an AI winter. Um, but anyways, that's kind of a, a little sidebar. Uh, then the, the next really important development was basically in 1980, which was backpropagation. And as is often the case, as we understand things more, so backpropagation propagation, uh, is essentially the key thing that allows us to efficiently train uh, feed for, forward neural networks. Um, basically, we go pass forward and then we can uh, propagate back uh, which is how we compute the, the, the gradient, basically how the, the output, the final activation changes um, if we modify the weights and biases. And we'll talk about that a little bit today. Um, so, you know, as people understood more about this, then as I said, is often the case, this thing was discovered in various forms earlier. And in particular in the 1970s, um, pretty much everything could have been done 
with that propagation, but the you know the, the big splash was, was in the eighties, um, and then uh, then after that, all of a sudden we could do all kinds of cool things. Uh, so, for example, in the eighties and nineties, all types of new neural networks. So we talked about these a little bit last time: recurrent neural networks and convolutional. So recurrent are basically for time series data. So when the, the new data point or the new whatever it is um, depends in some uh, very strong way, there's strong correlations between uh, one training image or one training piece of data and the next. Uh, whereas convolutional neural networks are something that's good for images. And in that case, there's no strong correlation necessarily between individual images, right? So a, a recurrent neural network might be good to understand a video uh, broken down into frames of a cat walking, whereas a convolutional neural network might be the best thing to look at different pictures of cats and identify that there's cats in them. Um, so there, there are no direct correlations between two pictures of cats other than the fact that there are cats in both of them. But in you know recurrent neural networks, given one picture, you could essentially interpret what the next one was going to be. So they, uh, we'll, we'll potentially get to talk about some of these subtleties later on. Um, and then, the, you know, the, so these were still in the realm of, uh, although they were used a little bit uh, for some applications, it wasn't really until the early 2000s. Uh, that there was really good applications uh, and particular deep neural networks became uh, useful. And then basically a combination of, as I said, increased training data um, and increases in computational power, particular GPUs, then the next very exciting thing to happen, which we talked about last time, was 2012. Um, and I remember from last time what, what happened in 2012. That wasn't the Go thing, was it? Where the so first that's a little bit later. But that's later. That's just recently, right? Well, 2015. Um, that's right. Yeah, it's all, it's all kind of recent, right? That's, it is recent to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's what's so fun about this class. Everything is really recent. <laughs> uh, did they start to use the GPUs? Uh, so yeah, GPUs, and in particular, AlexNet won ImageNet that year. So that was when the the deep neural networks. You know, they there was this beating the the uh, the next best uh, comp competitor in uh, in ImageNet by I forget what it was, 15 percent or something like that. Um, so this is AlexNet. Gwyn's ImageNet. And then we have the next one, 2015 is AlphaGo. The first time a human player was built. And actually I should point out that, you know, even way back in uh, these early days, there was things like checkers based on neural networks that was good enough to, to beat humans. Um, but it wasn't really until 2015 and uh, this deep neural network uh, AlphaGo beat the, the best player in the world. You know, that's when people really started to take notice. And then of course, now we're at today, there's too many things, but you know, one thing that was announced right before Christmas that people might have, have uh, seen is this alpha fold, where there's some kind of equivalent competition for doing protein folding. Uh, and alpha fold was able to, again, destroy the competition more or less. Protein folding is a, is a very difficult, um, at least, for us challenge. I mean, our bodies do it pretty well because we only every once in a while miss full proteins, which leads to things like uh, mad cow disease. Um, but for the most part, we're pretty good at folding proteins, although computers have a hard time with it. And that's just, you know, the most basic, but I think it's just interesting to see how much has happened in, in 60 years um, where, you know, now we're teaching this stuff in a physics class because uh, you know, these, these methods are incredibly useful across the sciences. Okay, so let's uh, let's start getting into some of the nitty gritty. So, what do I mean by uh, by a neural network? Well, really, at its simplest form, I'm just talking about uh, some nonlinear function of many variables that can depend on a large number of parameters. So that's basically my definition. So, a nonlinear function. that depends on many variables. Oh, 
or maybe it's better to say uh, a nonlinear function of many variables. Okay, that depends on many variables with a large number of parameters. And by large number here, I mean a lot, right? So it's not unusual to have deep neural networks that could have hundreds of thousands of parameters. Um, that's a lot. Uh, that's why things like this bias, bias variance trade-off and overfitting and, you know, all the, the hard work we're going to have to do is going to be, you know, how do we uh, not just overfit um, with all of these large number of parameters? And there's physicists actually making very interesting contributions in this field around statistical learning theory um, and things like that. Um, but it's this large number of parameters that gives neural networks their, their power, um, but also leads to, to certain types of, of dangers um, that, that we'll get into. And we're going to start by uh, considering the simplest type. Which is so-called feed forward and we'll understand why that is. World neural networks um, and our first example that we'll play with today and in the kind of more hands-on session on Thursday uh, will be around classifying very simple images and in this case the most simple we're going to look at uh, you know can we identify whether there's a, a rectangle in a picture basically um, that's that's what we'll start with and, and play around with um, All right, so we, uh, we saw lots of pictures last time, um, but let's just draw what I mean by some type of, of neural network. So I have some layer, which we call the input layer. And I have some layers that I call the, or that are called the, the hidden layers. Um, and then maybe I have some uh, final layer that is the output layer. So, I'm going to call this input layer. This is a hidden layer. And this is the output layer. And so in terms of our definition of a nonlinear function of many variables, well, the variables all go in this input layer. So this is where the variables come in. This is the thing that we're, you know, this, this nonlinear function is a function of this input layer. All of the, the parameters are gonna be encoded both in the, the biases and the weights, which I'll draw in a second. And then we have an output that's gonna come, come out the other side. So just to build it up one little piece at a time. Um, so I have some input, it's a vector, let me call it X. So each of these neurons, these, these circles, represents some, some value in this, this vector, which, which I'm calling X. And then the thing that's gonna come out here on the outside is some output, which I'll call F of X, right? This thing is just some nonlinear function. And then where are these, these parameters? Well, as I said, these parameters are all tied up in the weights and the biases. And so basically what we do in a feed forward neural network is we connect each neuron, each node of the network with every neuron in the next layer, starting from the input and propagating all the way to the output. But in the architecture that we'll consider right now, there are no interlayer connections. So what do I mean by that? Basically, if I wanna draw this network structure, I start from a node and I, whoops, I erased there. Let me undo that. Um, I just connect every single One of these in the input layer. Luckily, notability gives me the possibility of snapping my lines to straight. Otherwise, this would look like a real hot mess. It does anyways. And so what you'll notice is that I don't have any connections in this layer. Right? So there's no lines connecting one of these neurons with, let's say, this one. I don't have any in, in, in this architecture right here. Um, each one is connected to each node in the next layer. And then I just do the same thing. So then I keep going forward and I say, well, in this hidden layer, now I'm going to connect each of these to the output layer. So I do the same thing. Luckily, there's a, uh, only two per.
And so then the parameters of, uh, the, of this network are just encoded in basically what we call the weights, which I'll talk about more. That's the strength of these connections. If I want to drop out a connection, if I don't want to have a connection, then I can just set that weight to zero. Um, and the bias, I'll explain a little bit more in a second, is just related to how, how much weight I, uh, I need to make a certain type of decision happen. Yeah, Emmanuel, question? Yeah, one question. So it is not uh, super clear to me what... Do we have in this hidden layer? Is, is this some other function itself? Yeah, so we'll talk about exactly what this means. But for now, uh, think about the fact that each of these neurons is going to do something. So it will represent some, some uh, local function. And that local function will be a function of, of essentially the incoming information to that neuron, which is going to be characterized by uh, the weights, uh, basically what happened in the previous layer. So what happened in the previous layer will be propagated to the next layer. We'll act on it, and then that will continue to propagate forward. And we'll do an extremely explicit example here in a second, where I focus on just one of these. Okay, thank you. Uh, and so, okay, are there any restrictions? Well, basically, the, here the input x, uh, this is my input, is just some vector of numbers. So for the example that we're going to see, I can imagine that these are, are binary numbers, but uh, they, in fact, could be anything. Um, so the inputs. Just an array of numbers. So e.g., let's consider a bunch of input binary numbers. So what does that mean? So here, how many did I draw? One, two, three, four, five, six. So x is just some vector with six positions. It could be real numbers. It could be complex numbers. Um, we talked about when it was an image. It could be you know strings of floats that correspond to grayscale values or RGB values or whatever, but it's just some numbers. And again, for the sake of, of this, let's say it's, I don't know, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1. I don't know, it, that's just some number. So this is the, you know, this is the X. This is the thing that our function depends on. Uh, and uh, then all the magic of the network is what's gonna allow me to uh, propagate that information that's the input to produce this output F of X. So this obviously looks pretty complicated at this point, uh, but the, the building blocks are pretty simple. The, the beautiful thing about neural networks is that even though you know, we have all of these parameters, essentially we just can have one very simple function at nonlinear function at each one of the neurons. And that's the same function that doesn't have any parameters in it. So all of the parameters are just gonna be encoded in these weights and what we'll call the biases, which I'll explain more in a second. Um, so essentially, the uh, let's focus on just a single neuron. Uh, so we'll just take one of these right here and ask, or let's say this one, um, and ask what it actually does. So we're going to zoom in on this, this uh, single neuron. And again, we think of this output of the neuron as just some nonlinear function of the weighted sum of inputs. So we will consider, we'll take it. Uh... Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, the, the first kind of mathematical model of a neuron was this perceptron that uh, we mentioned from the 1950s and 60s. So they're not really used in, in modern neural networks and we'll talk about that a little bit, um, but this was developed in the 50s and 60s by Frank Rosenblatt. And this was sort of inspired by biology. Um, basically, the idea here is we take, uh, we take several binary inputs and we produce a single binary output. All right, so let's let's zoom in on this picture. So here I have my neuron, which is going to be my perceptron, and I have a bunch of inputs to this thing.
So let's say there are n inputs above there was six. So I'll call these, I'll always use zero based uh, indexing. So I have some x0, x1 up to xn. And this thing is just a function. So it's a binary function, right? We have a bunch of binary numbers coming in. So this thing is just a black box that encodes some type of, of Boolean logic, some function um, that produces an output. And that's a binary output, which is gonna be a zero or a one. Right, so all of these are either zero or one in, in this particular model and it produces this output. So the input's just a series of numbers um, as we described, there's, you know, they're in this case, they're binary numbers. Um, so then what we do with the, the perceptron is we introduce weights. We'll call them, let's say WJ. And so those are just going to be real numbers um, so in other words, each of these links is associated with some real number. So here's these, um, these weights here. And uh, basically the idea of the perceptron is that it outputs one if the weighted sum of the inputs exceeds some threshold. So let me write that out in words and then I'll actually write an equation for it. And then we'll think about what that actually means physically. So um, perceptron outputs one if weighted threshold, oops. Getting ahead of myself. Weighted sum of inputs exceeds threshold. I don't know about you, but whenever I write threshold, I'm always uh, heavily uh, biased toward act, uh, adding an extra H by accident. It just seems like there should be one. Um, and as a, a side story, so one of my, my roommate in college was, was French from France. And uh, we always used to make him say the threshold this Thursday, because it was like the one sentence that he was unable to say in English with his French accent. Uh, whenever I write down threshold, I just remember Jean-Yves saying, saying that the threshold this Thursday. Uh, <laughs> side. But I will continue. If I smile when writing threshold, that's why. That's exactly what I'm thinking of. Okay, so, so what does this mean mathematically? So the output, which is just a function of the input, right? So we have some input. There may be some parameters. In this case, there's these weights. Well, this is a piecewise continuous function. It's zero. If, as I said, if the weighted uh, sum is less than some threshold. So what does that mean? I sum over all these inputs multiplied by the weights. So the inputs here are just binary numbers, zeros or ones, and the weights could be real numbers, 0.76 or whatever it is. So at zero, if this weighted sum is less than or equal to some threshold, which I haven't set, and it's one if the weighted sum is greater than the threshold. Okay, so that is just a piecewise continuous function. It's clearly nonlinear. Uh, and uh, the, the weights here are just numbers that we can, we can tune. So what is this thing? Well, a way to think about it, a way that I like to think about it, uh, it's basically a, a mathematical device for decision-making, right? This is the, why it was uh, originally developed by, by Rosenblatt. So we can think of it as like, I have a bunch of inputs that are, you know, um, is it, you know, so, you know, the decision I want to make is, do I go to the park today? And the inputs might be, is it raining? Uh, is it a Saturday, right? I have a bunch of binary inputs. And then maybe it's more important of whether or not it's a Saturday than it is if it's raining. So I can weigh my different inputs, the input data that I have um, with different numerical values. So I weigh up a bunch of evidence and uh, you know, the numerical values of these weights can be used to make me weight some of my inputs more heavily than others, other pieces of evidence. Um, and then I can imagine different types of decisions by basically varying the threshold. Right? So sometimes I want it to be easy to make that decision. Sometimes I want it to be more difficult to make that decision. Um, so it's really just some mathematical device to weigh up evidence. So maybe let me just write that down. Um, All 
And this is where the terminology of, of weights comes in. Um, and then, as I said, I can change this threshold, which right now is just some number uh, by uh, to, to make it harder to make some decisions. You know, in some cases I need much, much more. I need a higher threshold if it's a very important decision, but it might be a lower threshold if it's not such an important decision. So the parameters, the many, many, many parameters that I talked about are basically just the, the weights and this threshold. And so now I just, you know, put many of these together and then I can make very, very complicated decisions. Just like in a, in a regular circuit, I start with the simplest gates and or and so on. And then I can build things up like an adder, right? So in the same way that we can do uh, Boolean uh, logic here, I can make logic around decision making by just connecting a bunch of these together where, you know, each of these is one of these neurons and here's all my information. So now, you know, I have some set of initial evidence, then that, you know, that comes in and, and turns uh, these on and then that propagates forward. So that's basically the idea here. Um, and uh, there's a couple of, um, a couple of mathematical simulation or, or simplifications that we can make. The first is that it's actually a little bit inconvenient to have the threshold on the right-hand side here. It's better to have it on the left-hand side. And, and this is where the terminology of, of bias comes in. I'll explain that in a second, but let's make two, two mathematical simplifications. that will just save us lots of time. Actually, the first one is, is uh, pretty obvious. It's just that this sum, uh, wj, xj, this thing is really just a dot product, right? So if I have uh, a, a vector of weights w, then this sum is just the scalar product or the dot product of the vector w with the, this string of inputs x, right? So just to not have to continue to write all these, uh, these sums. Um, and the second one, as I said, is we want to move the threshold to the other side. And we do that by defining some bias B as just minus the threshold. All right, so then we can then recast uh, where we call this B, let me write it down. Bias of the neuron. So biases live on neurons and weights live between neurons. That's one way to think about it. So what we can do is we can basically uh, write our new function F of X well, now it is zero if w dot x plus b. So remember, we're moving the threshold, we're setting the threshold to be minus b and then moving it to the other side of the equation uh, is less than or equal to zero. And it's one if w dot x plus b is greater than zero. And then we can say, well, this thing right here, what is it? I can call this thing z. This is just the most general linear function that I can have, right? In any dimension, uh, it's some, it defines some hyperplane. So I have a, a set of, of linear variables, X, remember the X's are the variables here. I have a bunch of, uh, of uh, scales for those, those are the weights. And then I can have some bias which shifts things around in all the dimensions, um, which in this case is, is the bias B. Uh, another way to think about what this bias B is, you know, it's how easy it is to make the perceptron equal one. And so in biological terms, that's kind of like the activation potential. So it's the potential needed to make the neuron fire. So we imagine zero is a, a neuron that's off and one is a neuron that's on. Um, so this thing, as I said right here, this is just the, the most general linear form, uh, linear function of the inputs. And f of z in this case, or x, um, is just the, uh, is a nonlinear function of the inputs. And, and this kind of nonlinearity is important because if we didn't have a nonlinearity at the level of a neuron, then our network wouldn't be able to do anything nonlinear, right? The only thing we could capture is linear phenomena in this network. The, the fact that this is a nonlinear function, it maps, you know, if I have uh, 
w dot x plus b is less than zero, then that's maps to zero and everything above that maps to one. That's a, by definition is a nonlinearity. So let's see that even more clearly. In, you know, let's actually plot. So what is this function? It's just a piecewise continuous function. Whoops. So here's my f of let's call it z as a function of z. Let's put c equals zero right there. Well, what is this thing? It's zero for z less than zero. And then it's one. When z is greater than zero. And people have probably seen this type of function before. Anyone recognize what this thing is? Step function. Yeah, just the step function, right? So it's the, the heavy side step function, which sometimes people use capital theta for. So this is the perceptron. It was used in, in lots of these kind of toy neural networks uh, a while ago. Um, but it has, so it, you know, it, it incorporates this kind of intuition about decision making that it weights all these inputs and then produces an output that's neuron is firing or not based on this weighted set of inputs but it actually has one major flaw which is why we don't really use it anymore can someone think of a a flaw in this thing keep thinking back to what i talked about last week um one of the most useful properties of these networks he's lots it's not of uh, differential yeah oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so someone hollowed it out. So it's it it has a discontinuity, right? So it's not differentiable, um, and uh, moreover, it's basically z, the de the derivative is zero for less than z less than zero and z greater than zero, and it's essentially infinity. It's a delta function um, at uh, at zero. So this is not very useful for actually performing computations on, because ultimately, what we want to do, what we're building up to, is we want to change the weights and the biases to get our network to fire in some way to produce some output that we want. Um, so this is not differentiable. So for that reason, people have come up with all types of other, uh, other nonlinear activation functions that do more or less the same thing, but have the benefits of being differentiable. Um, and so one of the, the more common ones is the sigmoid. So these are, uh, so we call all these things activation functions. Again, connected to this biological idea of once our weight or once we weigh our inputs above some threshold, the thing turns on, but below that it's just off or dark. Um, and so the one that's used quite a bit is called the sigmoid. And so you know, in terms of our Z, what does this thing actually look like, right? So this would be, if we expand everything just to be very explicit, you know, it would be e to the minus. So I have a sum over j, x, j. Well, let's put it in the same order as I did last time. w, j, x, j um, minus b, All right? So, okay, why is this thing a reasonable uh, approximation of this f of z? Well, if we plot it, it certainly looks more or less the same. So here's my sigma of z as a function of z, we'll put z equals zero there. So it, it does, it has more or less the same behavior. It's at large negative values at zero, then it kind of smoothly turns on and goes to one. All right, so how do we see that? Well, let's think about the limits, whoops. limits, well, if I take uh, z to be very large, right, so that's in the where the, the perceptron would always be one. Well, if z is very large, e to the minus z is just zero. So I get one over one, which is one, right? So if z is very large, this thing's always one. And if z is, is very uh, negative, then this e to the minus z looks like e to the uh, plus absolute value of z. And then that's a very large number. 
one plus that is just e to the uh, large uh, e to the absolute value of z. So what do I mean by that? So you know, this would basically be one over um, approximately equal to one over e to the absolute value of z, which is e to the minus absolute value of z, um, which is zero, right? For large z. So it has the these two two limits, and there are many other. So so this is one. Uh, there are many other types of activation functions that people use and that we will use in this course. Uh, they all have different pluses and minuses. They were designed for uh, various reasons. So let me just, just so you've seen them because we definitely will use them. Let me just draw them out for you here. The, the most common ones that we'll use in this course anyways. Um, so let me just call them generically f of z versus z. Oh, and I just learned something. Let's see, uh, speaking of machine learning that you can do in Notability, maybe everyone's way ahead of me. Um, you can convert uh, hand-drawn equations to tech uh, inside. That's pretty cool, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, as even my really ugly hand-drawn equations can uh, can turn into nice, uh, nice. <laughs> That's really back. cool. Yeah. Right on the next one. That's a good question. This one, I don't know. Let's see it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're living in the future. Yeah. Is it a function for the... No question? No, we're getting some weird feedback in, in the audio. Riz, you may need to turn off your camera if you want to actually be able to talk. Sounds like Chipmunk. <laughs> Reminds me of Yuri that one day. Is that oh, yeah. William? <laughs> or was it? Yeah, it was actually. I know. <laughs> if you can't get audio to work, feel free to type it in the chat and I can try to answer it there. So now uh, you're, you're muted if you're trying to. Uh, go ahead, no problem. Okay. All right. Okay, we can come back to it. Um, all right, so let me copy this. Uh, we'll, we'll duplicate this a couple of times because I'm just going to... You did have a question. Somebody asked, are you writing an iPad? Oh, yeah, I am writing on an iPad in, with Notability. Yeah, thank you. And by all means, if you have cool technical things that uh, you use like that. You know, as I said, when I discovered that I was pretty excited, please feel to share with everybody. That's the stuff that I love. Um, okay, so as I said, they, they all have the same kind of properties. You know, the one that physicists might recognize or be familiar with is the hyperbolic tangent, right? The hyperbolic tangent looks uh, very similar to this. So that's certainly one that, uh, that people have, have used. It has some uh, benefits and, and drawbacks. So it does kind of the same thing. So that's, and h of z. One that we'll use quite a bit, uh, it's called the rectified li linear unit or, or ReLU. So it basically has the form where it looks like the perceptron for z less than zero, but then it just has slope equal to one for it. So this you know, has this kink in it, um, certainly at this point right here, uh, but we can still essentially make the derivative, you know, the derivative is zero for z less than zero. So let's put, um, So here's my zero, zero. So this is essentially the maximum of z and zero. And so the, the derivative is zero for z less than zero and just one um, for z greater than zero. And then all the other ones are basically different ways of doing, so this is called the rectified linear unit or oftentimes in, in TensorFlow, we call it the ReLU. There's a leaky ReLU, which basically fixes the problem that the derivative is zero for z less than zero. So we just give it some very small slope up to zero, and then again, change it up here. So it's just putting two lines together. Um, so for example, this might be 
I don't know, I mean, it's essentially can be whatever you want, but it might be, it's a piecewise continuous function that is, let's say Z over 20 for Z less than zero um, and it's Z for Z less than or equal to um, Z greater than zero. So what about differentiability in this one and the last one? So the, the difference is uh, for the linear unit, the, sorry, the, the, the uh, rectified linear unit, the slope is exactly zero for Z less than zero. And here I give it some really, really small slope. So the derivative would be a small positive number, but not exactly zero. I'm talking about differentiability because they are not differentiable at these points. Sure, but they, they're not zero. So this, so if you, th if you think about going back to the perceptron, so here the derivative provides us no useful information. It's zero here, it's zero here, and it's infinity here. Mm -hmm. Whereas at least here, I know that my, der like my derivative is a positive number here. And so I'm not gonna keep pushing. I have some, uh, some ability to, to make changes if I take the, the derivative of this because it doesn't give me, whoops, it doesn't give me exactly zero. It's still some number. And, and so then the next one tries to fix all of these problems by uh, essentially having some exponentially slow growing. So well, I guess it still has the problem right at, at, at zero, but away from zero, everything's fine. Um, this is the so-called exponential, E, LU, exponential linear unit. And it basically looks like the following. It's some very slowly varying exponential and then switches to linear at that point, z equals zero. So this would be something like, and the, the, the fact that it's not differentiable at a point will turn it in practice to be not such an important issue because we're thinking about, you know, we're only encoding our numbers to double precision, let's say our float precision. And so it's very unlikely that we'll be exactly at the point z equals zero, right? So that we only would have to worry about that at a single point. But if there is like some issue with that, uh, like, like why would you use a, the ReLU or the other types of ReLUs when you could use the sigmoid? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, so the, the, well, okay, so the reason why you'd use the ReLU again is because the, the, there still is a non-zero derivative, right? So it's not exactly zero. So the derivative will show up in, uh, when, we, when we do back propagation, it'll show up in essentially how we do our convex optimization. So having any non-zero value for the gradient will allow us to make finite steps towards the minimum of the problem, which is what we wanna do. Um, the nice thing about the ReLU is that the derivative here is just a number. Uh, and so that's why you'd wanna use, you know, so you don't have to actually compute it. It's always the same number. It's always just constant there. Um, it's one, regardless of the value of Z. And there's, there's others uh, as well. So this is Z less than or equal to zero and Z, um, Z greater than zero and dot, dot, dot. Okay, so, so as a summary before we, we start actually doing, building up an example. Um, so I have, so let me just do this. So here, you know, we'll use these and other ones. Um, so just to summarize everything that we've talked about today. Let me draw some um, small neural network. All right, so the summary, the thing that you should remember after today is we have a neural network is made up of layers. We have an input layer. It always is basically just one layer. We have hidden layers. And in this case, there's one hidden layer, but we could have many of them. And okay, so is there anything special about hidden, right? Where, where does this terminology hidden come from? It's basically the fact that these are where the parameters live. So they're like the, the parameters inside your fitting function. They're hidden in the sense that they're not connected to the outside world other than through the inputs. So don't, you know, don't overthink it anything more than that. And then we have usually one output layer. And so what do we have? We have that each connection has a weight, W, each neuron has an offset or a bias, P. 
B. So the Ws live between the neurons, the Bs live on the neurons. Each neuron is just some fixed nonlinear function. So we always use the same nonlinear function, excuse me, whether it's sigmoid or relative or whatever it is everywhere. And the value of the input neurons are fed in from outside. Maybe I should have said that as the first one. Well, there's the last one. So uh, input neurons and from outside, I mean. So in other words, on the on these layers here, on these neurons here, there is no nonlinear function. Those just hold the values that they got from the outside world through the inputs x. When we say that each neuron has the same nonlinear function, uh, is that linear function the f of z? That's right, the, the same nonlinear function f of z. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So there's no complexity in the functions. The functions are very simple. The nonlinear functions are very simple. The complexity is in the parameters of the network. So let's think about an example. So I'm oh, perfect, we have 25 minutes left, excellent. Um, let's talk about an example and then we're all gonna try to spin up a notebook and see if we can go through this, uh, at least the first pieces of it. And I tried to come up with an example that was simple, but also kind of interesting and connected to some real world stuff. Um, and I kind of briefly mentioned what that was, uh, which is to identify if an image contains a rectangle. So when we talk about the icing model and magnetism, which we will uh, to the point where you're probably bored with that system, uh, this rectangle could actually be a cluster, maybe some cluster of spins or something like that. So, so what do I mean in terms of pictures? So let's think of a three by three grid. Those are gonna be the pixels of our input image. So let me try to draw this. Oops, I missed one, of course. It's not a very good equal grid. Oh, uh, one question. So, so like, um, do the neurons have the same function even, even for different layers? That's right, it's always the same function. Okay. Well, so, so what has happened here, delete. Notability seems to have crashed. Okay, let's turn it back. I would just try like closing the application and like a swipe up and yeah. <laughs> All right, perfect. All right, so what do I mean by a rectangle and what do we want our function to do? So basically what I mean is imagine that I have some three by three grid and these are pixels, they're gonna be binary inputs. So my input layer is going to have nine inputs. We'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more in a second. Um, and so I imagine something like this, if I fill in these two and the rest are blank, here I can imagine having, let's say that, um, and here I could imagine something that I'm not calling a rectangle, so maybe, this. So what I want is I want to design and try to produce a neural network that takes this as my input and I run it through my nonlinear function, which is the neural network f of x. Um, and in this case, I'd want to get at one. So there I have a, a rectangle um, inside it here. Similarly, I want one. Here I'm saying there's no single rectangle. So this is gonna give me zero. And of course, there are many, many such pictures, right? All possible uh, two to the nine combinations that I can have right here. So step one in this is just encoding our input vector. So what does that mean for us? Well, this is always the way that we do this. We always wanna encode our inputs as a one dimensional vector. So just like we talked about last time for an image of a cat, here it's very simple. 
I can say, well, this is my x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6, x7, x8. And so, for example, my input vector here, if it was this picture right here, would be 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. All right, so let's make sure we understand that. So x0, so I'm basically snaking. Oops, I'm going this way. So here, here, here. All right, so I'm snaking through this picture like that. If it's white, I encode a 0. If it's black, I encode a 1. And we're going to build a, a network to try to analyze this, this, uh, this picture and uh, figure out how we can produce a nonlinear function that might be able to answer the following question. If I gave it this as an input, can it produce a 1 uh, when I have a rectangle and a 0 when we don't have a rectangle? OK, so what are we going to do? So let me just draw again a picture of uh, some neural network here. So, so what does that mean? We need to have nine neurons in our input layer because I have nine components of this vector. So for example, I'm gonna draw one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And just for fun, let's say we have one hidden layer and we're gonna do something very simple, mostly because I don't wanna draw all the connections. I have two neurons in my input, my hidden layer which I'm calling layer one, uh, and then I have an output. And so why is this output only have one neuron? Well, going back to this perceptron idea, basically what I want this function to do is I want it to produce a zero if I don't have a rectangle or a one if I do have a rectangle. So my output is just a single binary number, zero or one, right? So this is gonna be the full structure of my network. Um, and I can draw all these connections, but Probably missed a few in here. It looks like I missed that one and this one. Luckily, there's only two here. And then there's my output. That's not the neatest one that I did today. Um, so I'm gonna. So we use this notation layer, uh, out, input layer, hidden layer, output layer. Well, we're gonna want to encode these things mathematically. So let's just start and say that this we're gonna call this input layer. We're always gonna co call layer zero. My hidden layer in this case, I'm gonna call layer one. And my output, my output layer, I'm going to call layer two. And again, the output of this network is going to be a zero or a one. Okay. So then, essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to define the so-called activation function, and let's think about the sigmoid or whatever it is. And we're going to propagate information from the left. That's why these things are called feed forward to the right. So going down the left, what we have is our like x0, x1, all the way down to x8. All right, so that's the input. Um, then what we do is we define the so-called activation. So we've seen this before. So my activation, now we need to actually give this thing indices because uh, it uh, is going to depend on which layer we're on. So we'll define the activation of the jth neuron on the elf layer as just this nonlinear function sigma. And again, we're gonna go through this in excruciating detail. Um, it's a function of the weighted sum of all of the weights, the weights on let's say the elf layer that connect the jth neuron and the kth neuron between two layers with the previous activation in the L minus one layer, plus the bias for the jth neuron on the L layer, right? And so what is this thing here? This thing is just what we saw already. We only looked at a single neuron, but because now we have a whole network of them, we have to provide indices. So this is just the Z that we saw before. It's the jth, the Z for the jth neuron in the L layer. So let's just look at, at some of these components so and write down what uh, what we're talking about and then we'll start playing around with actually potentially coding this up. Um, so J here 
is the index of the output neuron. And K is the index of the input neuron. So what does that mean? Well, let's say we're talking about this neuron right here. So this neuron has all of these weights coming into it. There's K, so in this case, nine, K neurons that are connected to it, right? There's K weights coming in. And there are two neurons in the first layer. So that's the J's, right? So there's also two biases, one for each on that layer. And so basically, once we've started from the left, so these X naughts are basically the same thing as, as I said, there's no function on the input neuron. So these X's, you can think of X, uh, K is equivalent to the activation on the zeroth layer um, of the Kth neuron. So once we have that, then we can just propagate this forward because if I say A, J, one, well, I know that the A zeros are just the Xs, the Bs are gonna be some starting values for the biases and the weights, which we'll randomize initially. And then all of the actions gonna be around updating these. So this maybe seems a little bit abstract right now. So let's let's try to, well, we have 12 minutes left. Let's try to spin up a, a notebook here and, and see what this actually looks like. And then we'll revisit this on Thursday and we'll go through all of these things in, in, as I said, excruciating detail. So let me stop sharing here. And uh, any questions about that before um, we actually see what, you know, as I said, right now it probably seems a little bit abstract. Uh, but I think once we actually work through propagating things in practice through this network, it'll all become a little bit more clear. But the, the core thing is that we just have a, a, these neurons, which are nonlinear functions, they take some inputs, they produce some outputs. So let me, I'm going to share my, um, this, okay. So I'm just on the Canvas page right now. And uh, so this would be a good place to start. And this course technologies is a very important place where I'm continuing to put information that's relevant for us. So what I, so if you can go to that course technologies, um, the first thing that I'd like us to do is basically get uh, an open on-demand um, Jupyter notebook. And so there's this link here, ACF login one. So if, again, if, if you follow along today, excellent. Um, if not, we will, if you can't get it working, it's not a big deal. We'll, we're gonna start again from this point on Thursday. Okay, so if you click on that ACF link, you might have to go through some UT login stuff and, and uh, put in your password. I wanna click on interactive apps here and Jupyter Notebook. So people already did this for the assignment. And again, all this information of what you should do is on here. I'm gonna put in this account, which is the project for this particular class. And uh, I'm gonna put in some uh, number of hours. In this case, one is, is more than enough because the class is gonna be done soon. And I put in a, a directory working directory here, which is my scratch directory. But basically what you would put on it, put in at this point is uh, Luster, Haven, user, and then whatever your username is. So my username is AG Delma. And we'll talk about creating this directory if you want later on. Um, but this is going to center my notebook. If you don't put anything in here, that's also fine. Uh, we can navigate to this point. Um, and I put what you should have if you want to copy and paste it right here. So I was trying to get this done while you were talking just a few minutes ago, just because yeah. I knew you were getting there. And if you don't put a directory, it will error out and won't open, it won't actually open a Jupyter notebook for you. Okay. Uh, it's, yeah, it's it wasn't doing that last night, but it started this when I was trying to do, I was doing the same thing he was when you were talking, I figured we we're going to get there. And for some reason it was giving me and my email was constantly emailing me saying, um, uh, you know, error and path for the ATF login. Okay. Yeah, it, it also doesn't give you an option to like look at the the uh, like fail reason in the email yet from the active on demand. 
So it, it usually gives you a error path, which you can pat from if you just log it in the terminal. Um, but uh, Jean Fang is still here, so maybe Jean Fang, do you have? Uh, do we actually have to put in a, a directory now? There's no default. I assume you have to put it there because the last night we updated the Jupyter notebook. Okay. Okay, so then everyone does need to put it in. Uh, so put in, type in, the, you know, or you can just copy and paste it from your, um, from the, the Canvas page, but it should be Luster, Haven, user, and then whatever your user, your net ID is. And I've just already created this other directory. Um, so I'm gonna launch here. And so it should bring me to this page. Now we're all going to be hitting it at the same time. So let's see how long <laughs> we're waiting in the queue for. Yeah. All right. Not very long at all. So once this thing has changed to green and says running, I can connect to Jupiter. And at this point, I'm in that directory that I placed, that, that, I, that I put myself in. So what we're all going to do is we're basically all going to set up a, a local kernel for us to install in our notebook. So for example, if I go up here to new, so everyone probably sees this Python 3, but what we're going to do today is we're all going to make it such that we can have this Python 3 ML4S, which means machine learning for scientists. That's going to have TensorFlow and all the stuff we need right now. So. The easiest way to actually do that is we can do this. We can actually create a, uh, an, if you only have Python 3, just click on this Python 3. And what you should see is something that looks like this. Yep. Okay. So this is a, a Python notebook. It is not, it does not have the, all the, the stuff that we need for the class. And so what Jungfang has helped us do is basically set up a local kernel that we can use such that we'll be able to see this in all the software that we need. So if you go back to the course technologies page, I put down here under uh, the open on demand section, the path to a script, which is in our project directory, cluster haven proj utk0154 local bin ml4s underscore setup.sh. So just copy that script copy this line. And before we run it, let's just see what it looks like. So if you're in, so this, this Jupyter notebook, if you haven't used it before, in this case, it's running on Python 3. It's just like a, a live programming environment, uh, like a REPL, if you're familiar with that. We actually have access to the shell underneath. So if we put a bang in, which is a, uh, the, the exclamation point, um, that gives us access to the shell underneath. So if I type bang cat, cat is going to show me what's in the script file before I actually um, execute it and just copy and paste that and hit enter. What this is showing me is these are the series of commands that we're all going to execute right now together. Let's hope it all works. Uh, basically, what we're going to do is we're going to load a module in the background. Uh, we're going to source that module. We're going to install a new kernel that's connected to this class. And then we're going to see if it worked. So uh, I've already done this before, so I'm not going to run it again, or it'll complain that I'm um, trying to install. I think most of us aren't going to be in the user group yet. Um, no, I think we all are. Uh, my permissions don't have me in uh, TUG twenty three sixty. So the, from, is, yeah, from yeah for me too. Last I saw, there was only two people that weren't added, but everybody else was. I think it takes a little bit for it to propagate into the system. Jungfang, do you have any comments on that? I, I think that most of us should be in it, right? When I checked this morning, only two was, were not approved. So may you send me a name here so I can double check. So if you're, if you're not able to execute this command, maybe just uh, paste your name into the chat right now. Well, I'm actually just getting a common error that says the name uh, Lustre uh, is not defined. Okay, 
like I search that design. So if if you did get something, if you did print this out uh, and it's working, then let's actually try to execute the script. So copy and paste everything that's not the cat. And paste that and you should be able to do a shift enter. As I said, I'm not gonna do it because it's gonna give me an error because it's gonna try to execute. Um, if someone that's doing it right now wants to share their screen, you can see what's happening in real time. Can you yeah. explain what it, this script is doing? Yeah, so just, just give me one second. Permission denied from James. After the session, is the black screen. One second, let me answer this question. It should take a little bit. If you see, like, on the interpreter where it says in and if it's running, it'll have a star, and, and once it finishes, it'll change to a number. So, right, and you should have a black dot here as well. <clears throat> Maybe on the order of 30 seconds. Yeah, that's right. And this is what you eventually get when it actually finishes yeah. it. Beautiful. All right, that's awesome. So, some people have what, uh, what Sean posted in here, hopefully. Eli says his worked. Amazing. Okay, so if it didn't work, um, I will keep this chat open and, and as I said, put your name in and then we can address those individually. Um, now the cool thing is if you just re if you just reload your notebook and you go up to kernel at the top, this change kernel should appear. And we can change our kernel to the new one. And it should take a second to, to spin oh, that I one. see that. That's great. Nice. So now everyone should be able to see Python 3 ML4S. So this gives us a lot of power. We can install all the software we need um, for this class and do lots of cool stuff. So then the, the last thing that we'll do today, just so that we're all on the same page next time. So again, if that didn't work for you, um, please type, put your name in the, in the chat and we'll address those individually. Um, so now what I want us to do is I want us to grab the, uh, the notebooks that we're going to use uh, in the class going forward, the, the Python notebooks that we'll basically go through together. And so if you go back to your course technologies page under the version control section, there's this git clone line right here. Git clone, so we're cloning a local copy of a repository. The repository actually lives up here on our UTK GitHub. If you, are, if you know a lot about GitHub already, you don't have to use this local clone. You can actually use the live one, but you would need to upload your public key to uh, to GitHub to our enterpri enterprise GitHub. So if you're interested in doing that, send me an email. And we can talk about it. I made us a local one. Copy that git clone. Paste it in here. Add your bang. So this is going to clone the course repository into a folder, which I've called ML4S. And now if I do a bang ls i should have a folder which is called ml4s so if i go back to my main so instead of being on the notebook now i'm going to go back to my home page and that ml4s shows up as a directory if i click inside that this is where we're going to serve all of the course material so every day we'll basically start in this directory from now on I can click inside source and there's a notebook right here, lecture one, a basic neural network. If I click on that. Now the key thing here is I need to make sure that it's picked the right kernel. So here it is not. In the future, it will always, as long as you save it with that kernel. So I'm gonna go back and change my kernel to Python ML4S. Okay. And we will start on Thursday, all of us working in this notebook. So if you, uh, you know, you can try to get it working uh, offline outside of the class, um, but we will start here. And my plan for Thursday is to really get down and dirty. We're going to start, you know, hacking away on this code and some other code. We're going to break into groups 
And uh, if you want, you want to play with it, uh, play with this. You can basically execute that first cell. And then I can run all. And what this should do it always takes a second to load things up as a as a first try. You can see up here it's is thinking because this dot is uh, the kernel is busy and I can see the star right here. See how long it takes. We might have to play around with it. I said, this is a new thing for uh, for us and for the, the cluster. There we go. Um, so you should see stuff that looks like this. And this is the, the network that I drew ugly by hand. I've generated here using some software called Viznet. So what we'll do next time is basically learn how to set the weights and biases and then start performing these activations uh, on the individual neurons and see how everything goes through. Um, so, yeah, so we'll, we'll restart on that on Thursday. So hopefully everyone- uh, uh, Wait. Uh, yep. So, yeah, by hand, you mean programmatically or uh, like- Yeah, so we're gonna, yeah, nice. programmatically by hand. We're gonna go through and execute these cells, learn how they work, and then write some code of our own to do something a little bit more exciting than this. Okay, so uh, if I wanna learn like, how, how to draw programmatically? Can you, yeah, will, will it have enough information? You want to learn how to draw this, this yeah, diagram yeah. right here? Yeah, so if you want to see how to draw that diagram, um, if you go back to the source directory, there's an include. If you look inside there, oh, I've lost my connection. Okay. Yeah, that happened to me. Uh, you got to read uh, for the one that, that Shiva there yeah that's what happened to me before he he's just not typing in right he needs to um redo the command his mind said that too so um, you may not have shiva you may not have the right path uh type yeah. it for, uh, for your so you know it's luster haven user then whatever your username is and then i put oh open on demand here but you do not need to have that yours should basically be like that well, look, make sure he puts the exclamation and then the forward slash right before that he copies and pastes it. I don't think he put the exclamation, otherwise we won't know what Lustre is. Yeah, it's going to show uh, Rizvana where this thing is. So this is going to take a second to, to start up. Are we uh, done with material? I have another class I got to yeah. drive to campus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're done with material for today, and this this video will be on. So if we do anything more, you can see it afterwards. So we'll okay. see you on Thursday. Thank you. Let's start up. Yeah, so someone, so uh, Eli is asking if you don't want to go into a notebook to run stuff on the shells, is there sometimes a terminal you can get to? That's a great question, and indeed there is. So up here on the top, under clusters, you click ACF shell access. That'll just drop you actually into a shell um, running through network, or it should be. You can, you can also, uh, if you like that better, and you know, um, you can also connect via SSH, which is, you can actually SSH and you can also get a terminal from within Jupiter. So right here, I can get a terminal. So it seems to be quite slow right now. I don't really know why it's, maybe we just have too many of us all trying to do it at the same time. So as I said, we're working on these bugs. Um, okay, so we wanted to see how one does that plot. So inside the ML4S slash source directory, there is an include folder inside there, I have a collection of scripts that we'll just keep adding to over the course of the semester. I call it ml4s.py. This is just a Python script. And this uh, code right here is what does the drawing of that neural network. So uh, if you're interested in, in looking at this, um, I use this Viznet package, which is a really cool package to draw. Not only does it actually draw neural networks, you can draw, draw quantum circuits as well. 
Sweet. Thank you. Have a look at that and we'll poke around and more of these things. Okay, so a few hiccups, but uh, I think, okay, there's my, there my shell has, uh, has shown up. So if you want a shell, you can get one um, through this. So hopefully everyone for the most part was able to get uh, that notebook spun up. Uh, we will start on Thursday's class at that point. So, you know, basically before we even get to class, if you wanna uh, have a notebook ready, set it for two hours or make sure that it's available for all of class. And uh, we're gonna go through a little, we'll revisit some of the theory and then we'll actually start defining these weights and biases and, and doing the activation as we go from layer to layer. So happy to answer any questions. Uh, if you have any specific ones or send me an email afterwards if you're still having problems and we'll see you on Thursday. Uh, I haven't got the permission to open the Jupyter yet with this, with our uh, class project. Okay, so uh, did you, I did can... you add yourself via the portal? Uh, yes, I can show you that, like the, what the error message says, uh, you are not authorized to charge uh, to project ACF UTK one um, five four. Did you go? Did you go to um, the, the? In the the, uh, the portal, which is portal.acf.tennessee.edu, you should see this click here to request a new project to be added to an existing project. So you've done that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, all right. So then something needs to be connected on the back end. Uh, so uh, Jean-Fan, can we get uh, Rizvan all added? Yes, we applied one minute ago. Okay. I'm not in class. I'm approving right now. Okay. There is. You, if should you, get, you should get in right now. Yeah. You. May, it may take a second for it to go through too. At least it did for me. So. All right. So I'm just scrolling back up through the chat here to see if there's any that I missed. Um, okay. So we have to put it in the working directory. That's good. But we know that now. Um, some people are in a grandfathered folder. I want to make sure, yeah. So that that luster is your scratch, which we're not um, limited by the the small ten gigabytes. Going to the chat questions here. Um, Gustavo asked about spectators, so absolutely spectators can uh, can add themselves to the, the project through this. Um, It's like otherwise, for most people, it's working. Great. Uh, for for some reason, um, after my session, say my session was successfully created. Yeah. I couldn't find the connect to Jupiter button, which it it worked last night when I tried to. Uh, so you don't connect. see this blue button right here, connect to yeah. Jupiter. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I don't know why. It, 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 never uh, it, it was probably you didn't have the working directory. It'll just error out and not tell you anything. If yeah, you got to put your directory that he told us to copy and paste from his tools that he showed us earlier. But 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 yesterday I did I didn't enter the working directory. They uh, they updated it overnight, is what they were saying. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. The sysadmin guy did it. Okay. Yeah, you the working directory. And that's basically to protect you guys because the your home directory is, is really, really limited. It's like 10 gigabytes. Uh, whereas your, your scratch space here has much, much more than that. Um, and so just to make sure we don't run afoul of any storage limits, you should be running everything inside here. Yeah, sweet. That's weird because I um, had the same issue so i left the uh directory line empty so it should go to my default uh directory but i still see the same arrow or yeah so, so so now we no longer now you actually have to type in this default direct the directory um here oh. you, if you put nothing it will not work but the nice thing is once you've done it once it will remember it in the future and it will auto populate 
Uh, so you should only have to do it once as long as you're using the same browser. And I know some people have had problems with Safari, so you might want to use Chrome or Firefox or Brave or whatever, whatever non-Safari browser um, that you like to use. Can I show and my screen and uh, like, can I share my screen? So yeah, I actually, guys, I got to run right now. I have another meeting that I have to go to, but I do have office hours on Friday. Uh, okay, so I'll you know, come to those uh, office hours and also at this, or before Thursday's class, send me an email and we can try to get things Okay, okay I right. completed the, right. the okay. assignment. Bye. Thanks, everybody. All right, see you. Thank you.